turn over to the book of Psalms and go to Psalm 90. As you find your place there in Psalm 90, you'll notice the title above Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Now, Psalm 90, clearly from the title, we know Moses wrote this psalm, which would indicate that it's certainly one of the oldest psalms. It may be the oldest psalm. Uh, it really doesn't change much. Uh, it doesn't matter. We just, God allowed us to find out who it was that wrote this. And then on the other hand, Psalm 91 appears that it may well have been written by Moses as well, just from the theme of the first two verses and the way they link together, uh, but maybe it wasn't. Um, it's interesting to note who the authors are. Sometimes there's other places of Scripture where they've written that uh, kind of help you to see the theme, but we know obviously the Holy Ghost wrote both of these Psalms, and whether they be old, whether they be more modern, if you think about the truth, um, even the last Psalm that was written would have been oh, 700 years before Christ or something along that line. Uh, Moses, we're going back here uh, 1,000, 1,500 years before Christ, well before even David. And yet, the truth of the Psalms all tie together, and they're as applicable as, as a modern uh, newspaper, and actually more accurate. So uh, we go into Psalm 90, and notice how it begins. It says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Now, back in the book of Deuteronomy, right toward the end, God says the eternal God is our refuge. Now, God used Moses to write that. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. In Psalm 90, you're going to note that the eternal God being our refuge is emphasized. And we know Moses was the author of both, the human author. And then, of course, in Psalm 91, it begins, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, which reminds us underneath are those everlasting arms. So those themes indicate that perhaps Moses was the human author. But whether that be the case, I want to note down in Psalm 90 the emphasis there of the eternal God. Now notice in verse 2, he says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You know, we don't have to speculate that God is eternal. There's really no other conclusion that you could draw if God is not eternal, then where did God come from? You know, sometimes somebody who's really smart and highly educated really think they've come up with a, a way to just put a Bible believer in their place. They ask us this uh, massively what they believe philosophical question. Well, you believe in God. Where did he come from? Well, you know, if you want to ask me where God came from, I've got a simple answer. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God had no beginning. Now, my question would be back to that person who doesn't believe the Bible. My question is, where did you come from? Now, that's much more difficult to answer, isn't it? If there is no everlasting God, then where did you come from? Well, I can explain that very easily if the person says, I mean, obviously, I came from my mother. And, of course, you keep going back. Well, where did she come from? Well, at some point, uh, we crossed over from the primate world. Um, and then where did they come from? Well, they used to be a fish. And what about that? Well, we were an amoeba. Uh, well, how about the Big Bang? Well, where, where did the, the, the substance and the material and whatever it was that took to blow it up, where did that come from? Well, maybe some aliens came down and seeded the life down here and planted it. Where did the aliens come from? The bottom line is someone or thing always existed. Now, what makes more sense? A non-animated blob of something always existed or an all-powerful, omniscient, sovereign, almighty God self-existed. Well, that makes a whole lot more sense to me. Now, all of that, just to simply say, God just spelled it out so even a child could understand it. Now, you have to be educated beyond your intelligence to, to come up with that kind of thing, but a child can understand from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Do you realize everlasting goes as far that way as it does that way? Because God is infinite. 
And he makes the, the point, and this helps you if you look at other places in the Bible, because he lays it down this way, before the mountains were brought forth, before the earth was formed, and the world, before any of that, God already is. There wasn't a time when he was created. So Moses is simply resting in that fact. Now, God used Moses, of course, to pin down in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. Well, in the beginning is about as far back as you can go. If you're a human being, in the beginning is just that. It's the beginning. Well, when the beginning took place, God was already there. Doesn't just mean in the beginning of man, not just the beginning of the earth, in the beginning. You know who created the beginning? God. See, before God created the beginning, there was no time. There was no beginning. God always existed. Now, this psalm emphasizes this truth. Look at verse 3. It says, Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. You know, what we find here is God will, will spell out how great he is. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Then he'll remind man what he is. And, of course, he's got a point that he's going to make. God says to man, in fact, you remember in Genesis 3, he says, from dust thou art, until dust thou shalt return. You know, God wants to qualify what a man is, dust. I mean, he used the dust of the earth to create us. I mean, if we become haughty and become high-minded and really think we're something, just remember, we're dust. Now, to the proud and haughty person who would stand up and say, look how great, look what we could accomplish, like Nimrod who built the Tower of Babel and said, we don't need God. We'll reach a tower that reaches up to heaven and we'll keep everybody unified and we don't need a God. A, a man like that was merely a mortal who came up with that idea. And of course, his great-great-grandchildren are still at it. We don't need God. Look what we can do. I mean, you know, you could look at some of this technological type stuff and it's so complex and uh, what we can do through technology and all of that. You could be real impressed with that. if you. But just stop and think for a moment. We're simply dust. Just a sophisticated compilation of dust. And no matter how much technology we've got, man still can't take dust and make a man. Even if he could, he'd have to get his own dust because God made that. So you understand, man is really... He thinks he's the sum of all things. He says, uh, you, you, you turn man to destruction and say, return, you children of men. We're nothing in his sight. But on the other hand, what about the humble child of God who realizes he's nothing and realizes he's dust? Actually, that's a comforting thought. You know what the psalmist says in another place? He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we're but dust. You know, sometimes if we to ourself, think to ourself, how could I measure up? God's standard is high. I'm glad Jesus died for me, and I know that that's going to get me to heaven, but boy, I still fail. I come short. I mean, I try and I fall. Well, you know, that's what this book is for, is to instruct us, not just when we're riding high, but when we fall. And it's a comfort to me when I fall to be able to say, well, is God still interested in me? Is he still interested in using me? The Bible says he knows my frame. He remembers that I'm dust. That doesn't excuse my sin, but it sure makes me feel better that God already knew ahead of time that I'm capable of failure. And that's why God made a way for me to overcome it through his precious blood. So he mentions that man is dust. Now, in verse 4, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it's past, and as a watch in the night. Now, he's still talking about the thousand years in verse 5. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. Now, that's, that's the thousand years. That's the way God views it. Now, Moses well knows how man uh, views a thousand years. Do you know when Moses wrote this, the world itself was probably not but 3,000 years old. I mean, it wasn't very old. Now it's just double that. Just three more thousand that have gone by. Um, you know, a thousand years to man. You're talking about, we've been here 6,000 or so years. I mean, you're going way back to Adam and Eve. That seems like a long time. 
He describes this and says a thousand years to God is like a watch in the night. You know, uh, here's a person who's taking turns setting up guarding. Well, you take the, you know, 12 to 3 shift to God as he views man. That's just a thousand years just swept away. Now, before man, no need for time. But even now that we have it, when God looks down at the history of man, you know, he doesn't miss any details. God knows every single function of history and the future all at one time. Uh, no man could comprehend it. You know, we, uh, back in the years ago, you had to depend on uh, what men wrote for historical type records. Before men wrote, you had word of mouth to keep historical records. There's basically no historical records other than they find a little artifact. Somebody might have chiseled something in a rock or painted a picture on a, on a wall. Uh, they'll dig up a little inscription here and there. There's nothing as complex as what was kept up with the Bible from years ago um, during the time of even uh, Job being the oldest book in the Bible. That in itself is a remarkable thing. But when you think about how today we have videos, now think about how much more accurate you think a person could study history today. Uh, they'll go back and say, well, here's the, here's the speech that was made. Um, here's the actual footage of this event that took place and so forth. But even if you have video, you can't possibly know all history. You know, uh, I might go back and I might watch a, a speech given by President Obama. I didn't watch it when he gave it, probably won't watch it now, but I mean, uh, you could go back and watch it. But that's just one clip of history. Do you know that same day, there was probably some little kid that hit his first home run out on a baseball game? Now, that's history too, isn't it? You will never find out about it. There's no video of it, but God knows about it. I mean, he knows all history and all the future at one time. And that's not hyperbole. That's what God knows. And to him, a thousand years of that is simply a watch in the night. Now, that's God. What does a thousand years mean to man? I mean, man thinks of one year is significant. I mean, he gets on and deals with that as far as man's life's concerned. Uh, a thousand years in the morning, in verse 6, it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening, it's cut down and withereth. That's the way it looks like to God. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. You know, nothing is hidden from God. All of this stuff that he knows, you know, he can know every detail of all history. He has it all at one time. He, he sees it. He knows it. He has knowledge of it. And yet, somehow another man can think to himself, God doesn't know. You know, Psalm 139 talks about whether shall I flee from thy spirit. And the whole point of that is I'll, I'll do this in the darkness. I'll do this when nobody can see. There is no difference with God between dark and light when it comes to activity. He knows it all. Now, Moses is, is, is uh, building up to this thought because he says in verse 9, All our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Now, you think about every day when you get up, all of the different activities you go through, um, from the time you were a very young child, whatever you can remember, how far you can remember back. Some people have deep memories of when they were children. Some say, I can't remember anything earlier than 12, whatever it might be. But those little details, little high spots stick out. They, you know, you say, well, let me tell you about when I was a kid. You know, back when I was, uh, you know, 14 years old, um, I was a star on the baseball team, and every time I got up to bat, I knocked a grand slam. I never missed a ball. Any of you can tell a story like that, let me know. But anyway, I mean, you, you're just given a little story, a tale that is told. How much of your life of that really was that? Just the high spots, right? That same morning, you, you don't even remember what you had for breakfast. That night, you don't know what you had for supper. If you broke your leg when you were a teenager, you probably don't remember if it was in, in August or if it was in January. I mean, it's like we just remember tiny little tidbits. God says our whole 
life from the time we're born to the time we die. As far as he's given man, he's trying to use a human illustration to say, here's how God would view it. He could, your whole life would be like me telling you a little story about the high spots, a little tale that's told, and that's, that's your life. That's what man is in comparison to God, and that's just with a human illustration. Well, then he gets a little more specific. In verse 10, he says, the days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we flyeth away. That puts things in perspective. Now, Moses, by the way, died at 120 years old, and his natural force was not abated. He was just like a young man. I mean, God unusually gave him stamina. And when, when Moses died uh, from 40 years to, to 80 years, I mean, you know, he had some guys he grew up with. They were all keeping sheep. When they were 40, they were all running up beside the mountain. When they got to be 50, they were waddling up the mountain. You know, when they got 60, somebody else had to go up the mountain. Moses is, you know, 80 years old, and these guys he's grown up with, they're all sitting down, you know, sitting around the campfire talking. He's like, come on, guys, I'm ready to go. I mean, he was just like a 40-year-old man. When he was 120 years old, he was still that strong. God, in a sense, gave us a little bit of idea what man would have looked like if he hadn't had the restrictions of the fall. He just unusually used Moses until, of course, when he told Moses, all right, your time's up, took him out. 120 years old, which is interesting in a mark of inspiration. Moses is obviously writing this when he's beyond 80 because he didn't even go back to lead the people out of Egypt until beyond 80 years old. So he's well past 80. He's writing the law here probably in part of his writings. So he obviously lived longer than this, but he's looking here at the natural age of man. Now, when I was in school, I remember learning and they were dealing with different historical periods. They said back in the, I'm just, I don't remember it well because I didn't do my homework, but uh, when I was about uh, the 1400s or whatever it might be, they'd say man's lifespan was only like 35. Then they said up in the 1800s, the lifespan increased and man started living to be 60 years old. And then, of course, today, our lifespan, when I was in school, they're saying is about 70. Now they're saying, you know, a man's lifespan is, is more than that. He lives up well into his 80s and so forth. Do you know man's lifespan hasn't really changed? What's changed is, percentage-wise, how many people die at a young age. So when you average it out, don't you know back in the 1400s, there were still people that lived to be 90 and 100 and 110 years old. It was just maybe far more unusual because of health concerns and we didn't have the, the medical type thing. The bottom line is we have got remarkable medical technology, which I'm thankful for. I mean, there's stuff that people would have died of 50 years ago now that probably just requires a minor surgery or some treatment. You know what minor surgery is, right? It's the one somebody else is having, right? So uh, we've got remarkable medical stuff. So, I mean, stuff, maybe somebody who died when they were 60 at one point, if the doctor could have got them at, at 50 and said, look, if you just start taking this statin drug and so forth, you won't have a heart attack and a stroke. They might have lived for who knows how long. No question man has tremendous medical ability. But now think about this. Why can't he get the majority of the people to live to be 100, 120, even 150? I mean, why wouldn't there be one? Because man's days are numbered. I mean... They're numbered. You're just not going to... Man can come up with all he wants. Now, if you asked some of these secular thinking people, they literally believe that if we come up with the right uh, adjustment to your DNA and, and solve all the problems with cancer and solve every health problem, eventually we're gonna, man's going to live forever. Now, people really believe that. They think science is the key because you know what? Science is their God. That is science falsely so-called. Moses laid this down Thousands of years ago, look, three score and ten, if by reason of strength you make it to 80, you feel good about it. If you push past 80, it's a blessing. It might happen. But the bottom line is your days are numbered. Now, since your days are numbered, what is Moses' exhortation to us? Well, he says in uh, verse 12, 
So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. You know, it certainly isn't original. It's all through the Bible. The emphasis in the New Testament and in the Old. I mean, basically at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, what's the whole duty of man? Fear God, keep his commandments. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. I mean, that's the same. He was just the best he could do even under the law. Why? Why do that? Because what I do here on this earth, longevity is not the point. I'm going to live in heaven forever. Or a person is going to live separated from God in hell forever because they rejected him. You're going to live somewhere forever. But what you do on this earth in this body has tremendous consequences. He's saying, don't waste a day. Don't, don't squander time because think about the importance of that little thing called life that we have right now. Teach us to number it. Every day is important. Now, that doesn't mean that every day I spend, you know, uh, I'm asleep for eight. I read my Bible for six, eat for two, pray for the other six. That's not practical. You're not, I mean, that's just not going to, that's not the only thing you can do that's profitable. But what it does mean is every decision I make, why not do it through the filter of the will of God? I mean, you got to work. You got to eat. You got to be a testimony. Even, even relaxation is, is part of the will of God. I mean, Jesus told his disciples, come ye apart and rest for a while. I mean, uh, it's actually the will of God for some people to go play golf. Okay, no amens on that? All right, let's try this one. It's actually the will of God for somebody to go fishing. Okay, I figured I'd get one on it. Um, it's actually God's will for you to cut your grass around your house. I know the women are going to say amen, right? Get the husband out there cutting it. You know what I'm trying to say is life has a lot of activities that are not spiritual. There's no difference in the secular and the sacred. Every part of my life is important. And it doesn't mean that every time I say, well, you know what? I think I'm going to cut the grass today. Let me pray if I ought to cut the front or the back. That wouldn't be a bad idea, but frankly, you don't always do that. You learn to simply uh, meet the need, do what task is that available, but what is our, our tendency is to, is to waste a lot of this life that God has given us, to not use it in a profitable way. But what is the grace of God? Everything I read in the Old Testament, it pushes me back to the grace of God. Hadn't every one of us wasted some of our days? No question we've wasted some of our days. Somebody could look and say, well, I wish I'd have got saved years and years ago. Well, you didn't. You got saved when you got saved. Here's the grace of God. Just start today. Move forward. Because I got a whole lot of years to live with the everlasting God. And those are not wasted days. Those days are never going to end because I'm going to be with him forever. Now, my goal tonight was to hit Psalm 90 and Psalm 91. And for some reason, our time is escaping us. But I'm going to touch on Psalm 91 very briefly because they're not unrelated. Now, again, the eternal God is our refuge, Psalm Deuteronomy 33. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Let me at least deal with this first section, and you'll see this. Look at uh, 90, uh, Psalm 91 and verse 1. Now, maybe Moses is the author. Maybe he's not. The Holy Spirit's the author. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Do you know in those two verses, we just read four different names for God all seen in the book of Genesis. Now, they're introduced there, and they're seen throughout the rest of the Bible. Many names for God. Now, the names imply something about his character. Really, what is God's name? I mean, he has uh, many names. What is Jesus' name? His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I mean... When you think about a name, but his name shall be called Jesus. You know, we do a name today to recognize someone, okay, so we know who it is. You know most of the Old Testament names. When God told a human being, name your child this, he had a purpose for that because it was prophetic. But 
what is God's name? You know, Moses knew, knew who God was, and he had heard different titles and so forth. But Lord, when I go to the children of Israel and say unto them, uh, God of your fathers has sent me, and they say, what is his name? You mean Israel didn't know what his name is? God is so complex. What is his name? So what he wanted to say to Israel in Exodus chapter 3, that particular time, is he says, I am that I am. What they need to know about me is this. I always have been what I always will be, and I made a promise to Abraham I'm going to keep it. Now, one of those names shows up here. But God is so complex, one name doesn't capture him. But stop for a moment and look at this. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Do you know when that shows up for the first time is in uh, Genesis, I think it's chapter 14, when Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, comes to Abraham. Abraham is impressed with this man. He didn't, have, he didn't know where he's from, where he's going. All he knows is he shows up, and he knows when he's won this particular war why he, why he was able to win it, because God had given the power to win it. Now he's got all of this spoil that he has won that he could have taken for his own. Abraham's a wealthy man. But the king of Sodom comes and says, I want to give you the spoil. I'll just take the captives. Abraham says, I'm not going to take it. I just met Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. And here's the way his, his title was, priest of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, you don't need to know the Hebrew word here. You wouldn't remember it anyway. But the Most High God, his, the whole idea that behind God is that he owns everything. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. Now, if I dwell in the secret place of the possessor of heaven and earth, what need could he not meet? He owns everything. Abraham said, I don't need your spoil. He said, I don't want to take a shoe latchet from you because I don't want anybody to say that the king of Sodom made me wealthy. He said, I'll trust the most high God. So he says, he that dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It was a couple of chapters later. Uh, Abraham, still waiting on God. He's been promised something. Hadn't happened. Now he's too old and his wife is dead. As far as having children, no way it's going to happen. And he appears to him and he says, Abraham, I am the Almighty God. Now, you've heard El Shaddai, and of course, that's what this is based on. This is the Shaddai of the El Shaddai, but I am the Almighty. Of course, Job saw him as the Almighty. He said, walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, that talks about God's strength. It talks about him being the satisfier. It literally, the word is a breast, as a baby would be satisfied with their mother's milk. I am the all-powerful satisfier. You see how these terms are unfolded. So I'm the possessor of the heaven and earth, if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, or abide under the shadow of the one who can satisfy. I will say of the Lord. Now, the Lord shows up, the name, but it's not explained until Exodus 3. He is the covenant-keeping God. You know why God, at the, end, the last book of the Old Testament, says to the people of Israel, look, you... <laughs> I gave you, brought you out of Egypt, basically, uh, gave you David as a king. You've blown it all the way. You've been idolatrous. I sent you into captivity to get your attention, brought you out after 70 years, let you rebuild the temple, put the walls up. Now Malachi is preaching to the people, and he says, basically, you, you're asking the question, where have we failed the Lord? Us? We, we failed? God said, there's only one reason you even exist. Why I haven't just rubbed you out and left a greasy spot in your place. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. Now, you know what didn't change about him? He made a promise to Abraham. I will bless him that blesseth thee, curse him that curseth thee. Now, many individual Jews, of course, received punishment for what they did. But as a nation, the reason there's going to be another Jewish king, and that's Jesus, is going to sit on the throne, is because he changes not. And that's what God is emphasizing. He is the unchangeable God, my refuge, my fortress, and then my God. 
and him I will trust. Do you know God is the first title that shows up for God in the Bible? In the beginning, Elohim, God. That's the, the God that we know, which, by the way, is plural. God, when he speaks of himself, he's plural, and he uses a singular verb. And we don't usually do that. That would be incorrect English for anyone else, but not with God, because God is plural, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And he says, the very last term here is the first one used in the Bible, in God. Well, what does that capsize? God, if you think about it, if you can put it into context of Scripture, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, you know, when the average, anybody who doesn't even know the Bible, when they think of God, that's, the, that's who they would think of because he's the creator, all-powerful, put us here. We're, he's, our existence is dependent upon him. And he says, my God, in him will I trust. He's the one that we can put our trust in. So Psalm 91 goes on to um, talk about the, the protection. And of course, the devil misquotes this passage in the New Testament, the temptation when Jesus was in the wilderness, as that he could jump off the pinnacle of the temple and God wouldn't let anything bad happen to him. But of course, the devil misquotes the passage and uh, takes it completely out of context. And he still does the same thing today. He started that in Genesis 3 and he still uses that today. People know just enough the Bible to quote it, or to misquote it, to try to use it for their own advantage. Let me just give you this thought. Anything in the Bible that you think's in there that makes it easier for you to not do right is not in the Bible. I mean, you got it misunderstood. If you're using the Bible to say, well, I can actually get by with this because, then you, got it, you, you need to re rethink it because that's not what it's telling you. Anyway, we're out of time. Let's go ahead and stop there.